Welcome to Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. The Old Testament authors consistently look back at the exodus from Egypt more than any other event to appeal to God's power and faithfulness in His covenant with Israel. Critical scholars deny the historicity of these events, and unfortunately, a growing number of evangelical scholars cast doubt on the historicity of the Exodus, Moses, and the people coming out of Egypt. To help us set the record straight, archaeologist Dr. Titus Kennedy joins us for two episodes where we'll be talking about evidence for the authenticity of the book of Exodus. Titus, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Thanks, Henry. Great to be back. Hey, it's great to have you back on the show. Now, when we say back on the show, the reason for that is, is because you were with us for two episodes previously. And I just want to mention this excellent book that you wrote called Unearthing the Bible. Uh, you have a great story, too, about how you became an archaeologist and your interest in history. We want to encourage folks to go back and watch those episodes so they can find out more about you. But we're going to take our time today to jump right into the question of the Exodus. So we're going to get, we're going to get right into it. Um, people know, of course, the story in the Bible as a general statement, Christians watching. The Israelites were in Egypt. They came out of Egypt under Moses, and they entered the land of Canaan. So let's place them in that context in Egypt to begin with and sort of set the stage for our conversation. Would you do that for us, please? Yeah, the Bible gives us a timeline. And for those who have been following ABR and reading articles, you're probably familiar with these main arguments. But the key passage comes from 1 Kings 6.1. It tells us it's the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, after the Exodus, is the fourth year of Solomon. And because we have very firm, solid dates for the reign of Solomon, we can calculate back to that Exodus date. So basically, 967 BC is about the fourth year of Solomon. Add 479 years to that, you get to about 1446 BC. But, of course, you have people with different ideas about the Exodus date. And I'd say generally people fall into three camps. Either they're 15th century BC, 13th century BC, or they think it's mythological. Yeah, and, and there, there are a variety of views out there. In fact, we did a series with Scott Stripling on the, on the date itself, you know, laying out the argument for the date that you and I are going to be advocating. So the date, middle of the 15th century B.C., around 1446 is the Exodus. So obviously the Israelites have been living in the land for several centuries. And so that's sort of the stage we want to set. So it would make sense. We want to look for archaeological evidence. If the biblical account is true, which we say it is, is there evidence? Is there evidence of a presence of uh, Semitic Israelite people living in the land? That's really the fundamental question we want to start with. Right. So we're, we're going to be looking at, is there evidence that Israelites or Hebrews were in Egypt in the 18th dynasty or even earlier in the second intermediate period? And the, the key site, at least right now, would be the archaeological site of Tel El Daba, or also known by its ancient names of Avaris and Ramses. That one has been extensively ex excavated. Uh, of course, it's also mentioned in Exodus 1. And so that is a great place to start to see if there's some match and some evidence. All right, so uh, maybe we begin with something like, um, well, Moses met with the Pharaoh in a palace. We read that actually explicitly in the text, right? That he, he went to see Pharaoh in the morning, uh, those kind of references. So let's start there. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of evidence has been found that could be connected to those statements? Well, the, the excavation there at Tel El Daba actually found an 18th dynasty palace that was situated on the branch of the Nile River. And that fits exactly with what we read in the text of Exodus about the palace being located there at, at Avaris or at Ramses, and with the palace being right next to the river. So, so that, that would fit the narrative. Now you're saying 18th dynasty. Um, this is a period of time that's really generally thought of as sort of the height of Egyptian power. 
Um, how would you say that correlates with the with the text, just that general that general way of looking at the 18th dynasty? Well, the the 18th dynasty earlier on, I think we definitely could say that it is the height of Egypt's power through the time of Thutmose the uh, Third. Egypt is expanding, becoming more powerful. We could look later in the 18th dynasty and. They're not conducting military campaigns and expanding Egypt like they did before. There is some internal development going on, but it's not the same type of thing. They don't have the same kind of force and international power as earlier in the 18th dynasty. So if we're looking at the exodus coming in the middle of that, then it, it explains some things in the historical context. Now, uh, another thought is, is as they're excavating the site, which they've been doing over 50 years, you would expect, because the way the Bible describes it, that a, a significant population grew of, of these, what we call Semites or Semitic peoples, the descendants of, of Jacob. Uh, what, what are some things that would point to that in the culture, cultural material that's been un uncovered in that time? Well, there are a number of things from material culture excavated at the site that would connect to people who had migrated over from Canaan, uh, who we might call Semites or who the, the Egyptians called Asiatics, and the Israelites certainly fit into that designation. Uh, so we have things like over 20% of the pottery is of this, what we might call Canaanite type. And then we have burials that are made in the type that people from Canaan or the Levant were doing. We have uh, temples and gods that have been imported from that area. Uh, we have actually two statues of Asiatic officials. So people like Joseph who rose up in the ranks, but they weren't Egyptians. Uh, we also have remains of sheep and goats. And the sheep specifically, we can tell that they were brought in from the Levant, from the Canaan region, because they're this long-haired variety. Yeah, see, these are the kind of details in archaeology that's really remarkable. Uh, it, it fits very nicely with the biblical narrative. So the sense of it is, you know, the, the, the people of uh, descendants of Jacob, they come into the land, they grow, and then you find this material culture that fits. Now, Titus, we did want to talk about something called also that sort of situates the exodus in this period, uh, called Papyrus Brooklyn, but we're going to have to cover that in the next segment. So um, let's, we'll do that after this break coming right up. And folks, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth today. I'm here with Dr. Titus Kennedy, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Titus Kennedy. He's an archaeologist. We're talking about the exodus from Egypt. Now, Titus, we were going to talk about Papyrus Brooklyn, but we're going to hold off on that a moment. Uh, so the audience can put that one in the parking lot here for just a moment. Let's talk a little bit more about some of this material culture from the area where, which is what the Bible describes where the Israelites grew in population. Right. One of the really interesting discoveries at Tel El Daba, uh, this Ramsey site, are numerous storage silos that they excavated from the 18th dynasty, from this just before Exodus period. I think that is incredibly significant because of the connection that we could make with that in Exodus 111, where it says that the Israelites were forced to build these storage facilities in Ramses, Pithom, and uh, Heliopolis for the Septuagint. So now you wanted to address the question of the use of the term Ramses because he was the great pharaoh uh, of a later period in the 13th century. And so people argue, well, it says Ramses in the text, so it must be 13th century. Um, 
But it's also mentioned in Genesis 47, 11, which is way back at the time of, uh, of uh, Joseph. So what's going on there with, with that? What, how do we explain that anomaly, not anomaly, but how do we explain the name Ramses in the text? So Ramses in Egyptian is a name. It's not restricted to Ramses II, the great. It just means born of Ra. And this name is actually attested from earlier time periods. Uh, for example, in the 16th century BC, we have a couple of people named Ramses. So even, even before the 18th dynasty and at the beginning of the 18th dynasty, we know that name is in use per Egyptian records. Also, this city, you know, what, what it later becomes called Ramses, it was not uh, it was not established or it wasn't uh, occupied first under Ramses II. Uh, it was actually built early on, you know, expanded from Avaris, at least by the time of Horemheb, Pharaoh Horemheb, decades earlier. So just defaulting to Ramses II for the Exodus doesn't make sense. Yeah, that, that's, that's good, and I think that provides a helpful explanation. All right, we, there's a ton, we could do several episodes just on the Egyptian context there in that area, but, but we do want to cover some other artifacts. Um, one is Papyrus Brooklyn. Now, we talked about this in our previous episode with you, but I'd like to just touch on it a little bit, just remind our audience of how important this document is. Right, so one of the major criticisms of an Israelite exodus is that supposedly there's no evidence that Hebrews or Israelites lived in Egypt prior to the Exodus. But then enters Papyrus Brooklyn, which is essentially a list of household slaves or servants from the Thebes area about the 17th century BC in the Second Intermediate Period. But on that, you have at least nine Hebrew names appearing. So if you're looking for evidence of Hebrews in Egypt prior to the Exodus, you really, really can't ask for much more than that. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. When, I, when, I've thought, when I've thought about this, uh, Titus, you know, we, we have the particulars of archaeology. It's like, what, what constitutes proof for something? The Bible describes the set of events occurring with the Exodus. What constitutes proof? You have a papyrus from the time period with Hebrew and Semitic names. And some of them, like, like the name of one of the Midrise, Shifra, is actually on the papyrus. So, you know, aside from videography, you know, what, what, what constitutes proof for, for, for historians and archaeologists? It's always a troubling question to me. Right. Sometimes the level, the level of corroboration expected for certain biblical stories is so high that it is not comparable to what would be used for other time periods, uh, works of literature, historical arguments, etc. I mean, if we were looking for evidence of Minoans or Hittites living in Egypt, even a small group of them, and then we found Minoan names or we found Hittite names, Egyptologists would not be so questioning about, oh, okay, there were some Hittites there, there were some Minoans there. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, I think we can see in that inconsistency and methodology and level of proof. Uh, but we can't detain ourselves there. Now we want to shift, shift to another papyrus. And this is something that you've been studying. It is controversial, but this is really important. We're going to spend the next segment, this one and the next one, developing some arguments here uh, called the Ipawur or, uh, papyrus or the admonitions of. And so I'm going to let you explain what that is. You've got about two and a half minutes for this segment, and then we'll go into the next one. So the Admonitions of Ipuwer is a lamentation poem. It's very interesting for many reasons, but there's only one copy of it that has ever been found from antiquity. And this particular papyrus dates to the 13th century, uh, 19th dynasty Ramesside period. Uh, we know that because it was probably looted from a Ramesside period tomb, and also the style of the lettering fits that time period. It wasn't found in a controlled excavation. Uh, it actually appeared on the antiquities market in about 1828, and it was sold to the Dutch government. But no one has said that it's inauthentic. So it's it's been verified as authentic. We just don't know the exact 
uh, place that it was pulled from. But within this poem, you have this author named Ipuwer, who is describing this time of chaos and destruction and death and sort of an upside down world in Egypt where the gods of Egypt are, are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're not helping. And he keeps, he questions this, uh, this God called the All Lord, and he questions the Pharaoh. Now, some people reading this have noticed that there are passages in there that sound a whole lot like some of the Exodus plagues narrative. And so this connection has been proposed before, but usually it's thrown off for a couple of reasons. One is the presupposition that the Exodus is mythical and the admonitions of Ipuwer is just uh, sort of a allegorical type of poem. It's, it's also not historical, they're saying. The second is that they claim that the composition of the admonitions of Ipuwer was way too early to be associated with the Exodus, ranging anywhere from the first intermediate period, middle kingdom, second intermediate period. Okay, All of them would generally be too early. And so I was trying to address both of these issues. Could it have been composed around the time of the Exodus? And secondly, uh, what are the, the really detailed parallels? Does it go beyond just a, a, a probable or possible coincidence to the point where you really start wondering, could this have been an Egyptian poetic account of that time of the plagues? Well, we're, you and I are going to explore that together in our next segment and talk about some of these possible connections. Really, what I see is you doing sort of a forensic investigation of this particular document. And we'll explain more about that right after this break. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith, I'm your host, and I'm here with Dr. Titus Kennedy, who's an archeologist. We're talking about the Exodus. Now, we left off in our last segment, Titus, talking about the Ipawer papyrus. Now, uh, just for clarification for our audience, the papyrus itself is dated from the 13th century BC, but uh, most people agree that the original is much older. So the question is, when did it originate? Because that would be the key to determining whether it can be connected to the Exodus. But I'm going to let you sort of just sort of walk us through this particular document and share your observations. Right. So it's generally dated between the first intermediate period to the second intermediate period, which would be too early for common Exodus dating. But this is based on a presupposition that it's allegorical and it's just describing the mood of chaos, all right? So they're not really looking at it as could this have been historical. But if we do an in-depth examination of the language used in this papyrus, we see that there are words and phrases that don't come into use until the 18th dynasty. So at the very least, we would have to say that the thing was totally rewritten in the 18th dynasty uh, with with new updated language, all right? But if we allow for the possibility that was its original composition date, then we can look at, does it have a link to some events that were in the 18th dynasty? Uh, second thing I'd say about the date is the name Ipuwer. So the name Ipuwer is actually found uh, on an inscription from the necropolis of Thebes dating to the co-regency between Hatshepsut and Thutmose III, so just in this pre-Exodus period. Uh, he's also found in a 19th dynasty tomb and in an inscription about kind of great writers of the past, and he's described as the overseer of singers, so he's, he was some kind of bard, and that fits with the, the poetic part of it. So the idea, one of, one of the things that you emphasize in your argument, and we're gonna, you're going to be writing an article for our magazine, Bible and Spade, is that poetry can be historical in terms of 
what it's pointing to. We see that in the Psalms. The Psalms talk about the Exodus, and they point to the narrative text. So that doesn't necessarily eliminate the historicity of this thing, even though it's poetic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, two historical examples that come to mind are, is the lament for Ur, which is a historical event about when the Elamites attacked Ur, and then the Lamentations of Jeremiah, which talks about the Babylonians attacking Jerusalem. All right? Both of those are historical events. It's the same type of writing as we find in Kippur. Okay, so let's have a little bit of fun here. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the probably the, may, possibly the coolest connection, I think, and then we'll kind of work our way through it, and having to do with the Nile River. Just tell the audience about what the Ipawur papyrus says about that. So this is the most obvious parallel and probably the one that for people first notice between the Exodus because he says that the river is blood. As one drinks of it, one shrinks from people and thirsts for water. So anyone familiar with the Exodus plague story immediately, oh, that sounds a whole lot like when we read about Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh warning him and then the Nile River is turned to blood. And people obviously can't get water from the river if it's blood. Yeah, so, so two points there is the Nile River was everything for ancient Egyptians. I mean, if the Nile River turned blood, they're in big trouble in every single way because it's, everything surrounding there is desert, uh, you know, except up in the Delta region. The, the, second, the second part of, of that is it doesn't say it looks like blood or it says it is blood in both texts. Is, is, am I right about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He, it's not a simile. He's claiming, well, both texts are claiming, that the river is blood, and they both talk about blood being throughout the land of Egypt. Yeah, see, that's, that's, that's a fascinating connection. So again, not, not enough to say this is the Exodus for sure, but again, your argument entails other things, the name Ipawur, uh, you know, the uncertainty of dating it earlier, and those kind of things. But let, let's move, move ahead a little bit here. One of the other connecting points is in the uh, fifth plague, having to do with domesticated animals. Talk about that a little bit. Well, it talks about a, a pestilence or a plague coming upon all these animals. So we've got some passages in Ip where like pestilence is throughout the land. There's no lack of death, right? So some type of, of plague or pestilence is striking creatures down. And then we have it talking about the herds of animals and cattle, how they're, they're moaning, they're, they're in pain. They're also in pain because of how terrible things are in Egypt. But there, there's something that's affecting life, and it's even affecting the animals, okay? A possible link to this exodus plague that affected the animals. All right, so let's make another connection. So there we have uh, allusions, actually, to cattle mourning, as you mentioned, and some, some pestilence going on in the land. That would fit the, the context of exodus. Now... The, the text of Ippur does not mention locusts, but it does seem to talk about what could be the after effect of locusts. Talk, please talk about that a little bit, Titus. There are a number of passages in Ippur that talk about how the agriculture of the land has been destroyed. And not just in broad terms, it's talking about like there's nothing left on the trees or the grain has been destroyed. And it doesn't, it doesn't specify all of this. I mean, there are passages that talk about fire burning things, but there's something that's happened that has just wiped out, taken away all of the food sources. And if we're looking again in the context of the Exodus, well, the locusts sweep through and they eat all of the, the fruit on the trees and the vegetables and everything that's planted. Yeah, and so, so there we have, so in summary, at least for this episode for Ipawur, and we're going to talk more about this in our next episode, so we want to ask folks to join us. Uh, we have these three main connections, um, and we're going to continue on with that um, in our next ep episode. You've got about 30 seconds to sum up our discussion so far. I'll put you on the spot, but go. So we looked at the site of Avaris or Ramses and how there's archaeological evidence of Semites, like the Israelites, living there in this pre-Exodus period. There's some specific links with the Exodus, like the palace being built right next to the river and storage silos being found there. 
We looked at uh, Papyrus Brooklyn, which lists about nine Hebrew names you know, on a slave list, servant list in Egypt before the Exodus. And then we looked at the Ippur Papyrus that might be a poetic rendition of the time of the plagues. That's fantastic, Titus. Thank you for being with us. And we're looking forward to you uh, having a conversation with me about the Exodus in part two of our episode. We so appreciate what you do. Friends, thank you for joining us today for Digging for Truth.